Okay, we're now recording. Okay, so a uh, little presentation about organ donation. Um, I'm going to try and cover the, the role of the organ donation team, um, who our donors are, who can donate. Um, I've gone into quite a lot of detail about the process of donation. Um, I do apologise if it's a bit too much detail. Please stop me if anyone feels a bit uncomfortable. Um, briefly covered the change in law in terms of organ donation and a, a little bit about that um, and then just finishing on uh, a bit about our donors and our donor families and and what we do for them and how we support them um, so just want to start by telling you a little bit about the role that we play um, in ensuring that transplants are as successful as they can be um, so organ donation is primarily a nurse-led service. Um, it's provided in all critical care units across the UK. So each ITU um, will have a specialist nurse for organ donation embedded within that unit. Um, across the UK, we're divided into regions. Um, so we are the northern region and we cover a total of 12 hospitals. So our furthest north is Cramlington. We go down to James Cook um, and across uh, to Whitehaven is our furthest west. Um, and between all those specialist nurses on those units, we provide um, a 24 hour on-call service for any potential donors that we have. Um, so part of our job is to take referrals um, of potential donors, um, make assessments on their suitability. Um, and in patients that we do think have the potential to become organ donors, we liaise with the staff on the ITU um, and speak to their families and find out if there was a recorded decision. We check, we usually check the organ donor register or speak to to their families and um, find out if they had made a decision. Um, and for those who do go on to be organ donors, we facilitate the whole process right from the, the point of um, speaking to the family up until after the donation has occurred. Um, and throughout all that, we will offer support to our, our families and our donors, which I, I will cover in a little bit more detail. So who are our donors? Um, so to become an organ donor, you actually have to die within critical care. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, I didn't actually know that before I did this job, even though I worked in critical care. Um, and it must be a controlled death. Uh, and what, what I mean by a controlled death is that we either suspect that the, the patient has suffered a, a neurological death, so a brain death, in which case we would, we would carry out neurological death testing to confirm this. Um, and this is what we call the DBD pathway of donation, which, which stands for uh, death after brain death. Um, the other donation pathway is uh, DCD, which stands for death after cardiac death. And those are the patients who um, have a very poor prognosis, um, no chance of survival, and the decision has been made to withdraw their life-sustaining treatments. So that, that usually involves taking them off a ventilator. Um, so the main difference between the two pathways um, for us is uh, what happens when we go to theatre, which I, I will cover in when I go over the process. Um, so there's a few common misconceptions about um, organ donation and who can become donors. We quite often get things like, oh, well, they had heart disease, so they wouldn't be able to donate any organs, or they had diabetes, so they wouldn't be able to, things like that. There's very few actual diseases that um, you aren't able to donate your organs. The, the main one really is an, uh, any active cancers, and that that's just risk of passing it on to somebody through through organ donation. But um, certainly somebody with, say, heart disease, they the, the still might have very good kidneys and liver. So um, it doesn't necessarily preclude them from becoming an organ donor. Um, we have donors from all backgrounds, all ethnicities, 
Um, there's obviously recipients waiting for transplants from all backgrounds and all different ethnicities. Uh, and we do have lots of resources available to us for speaking to families of different faiths. Not None of us are experts in it. So um, we, we do call on them when we need them. Um, so if we did have a patient who could potentially donate their organs, we would aim to offer this to their family as good end of life care. We feel like it should be offered to everybody who is in the position where they could help other people. Um, but having said all that, only actually 1% of people die in a way that would enable them to become an organ donor. So that's kind of why it's so important that we ensure that every opportunity um, that comes our way is, is explored. So a little bit about the process of donation and what happens. Um, I suppose for those of you who are waiting for transplants, it might give you a, an idea of what's happening on the other side. Um, so following uh, consent from a family, we do quite a lot of additional testing. Um, we'll look at specific things um, in terms of specific organs. Um, we do bloods for tissue typing. Uh, we look at the patient's past medical history. We ask the family quite a lot of questions about lifestyle. Uh, we speak to that patient's GP, uh, basically just doing everything we can to find out as much as we possibly can about that donor um, to make sure everything's as safe as it possibly can be. Uh, so when, once we have all this information, we upload it to our central database. Um, and that is the point where we would register the donor um, and our, our central, um, op we've got a hub operations they're called. Um, sorry. The phone going off in the office. Um, so, uh, yeah, we register the donor with, with Hub Operations and it, it's them who actually do the offering of the organs and, and the match and runs and finding suitable recipients. Um, so during that time, we have quite a lot of correspondence with um, the transplant coordinator. So um, Peter and Siobhan, we would be speaking to them. They sometimes have additional questions they would like to ask. Um, and we answer everything as best we can. Um, and then hopefully we would find suitable recipients for the organs that we're offering. Um, we wouldn't ever take a patient to theatre without having found a recipient. Um, so once we, we've found them, hopefully, um, it's that point where we, we would book a specialist surgical team um, that actually come to the donor hospital. So um, there are two separate teams. There's a, there's a team for cardiothoracic organs and then there's a team for abdominal organs. Um, and getting them at the hospital at the same time and making sure they're available is, is quite, an, uh, quite an operation, believe me. Um, so we, uh, that can sometimes create quite a delay, especially when there is two teams involved. Um, we've actually got three cardiothoracic teams in the country and we've got eight um, abdominal teams in the country so if there's lots of activity elsewhere in in the country then sometimes we do find we have really long delays in getting the team to the hospital uh, we're quite lucky we've got a cardiothoracic and uh, abdominal team based up in Newcastle so um, luckily, we don't often find we have huge delays, but I know elsewhere they quite often do. Um, so once the team arrive, we hand over to them and um, they get set up in theatre ready. Uh, so this, this is where the two donation pathways differ. Um, so we would then transfer the patient to theatre. So for the DBD, so the, the people that have already been declared um, dead by the neurological death testing, they're taken to theatre, still connected to the ventilator, still heart still beating, um, and their operation um, happens uh, while, they're, they're, while their heart is still beating. Um, and in the DCD pathway, um, 
this is so dbd is a bit more certain so we know that things are kind of going to go ahead we're definitely going to make it to the year um dbd is good in that we have the opportunity to make quite a lot further assessments of the organs so although we can do tests and scans and all the rest of it actually looking at the organs and seeing what they look like is is a really good way of determining whether they're they're going to be suitable for a transplant or not so in the in the patients who are, are following the dbd pathway pathway we do get that opportunity to do that um, and unfortunately, sometimes the, the blood results might have all been great. Um, the scans might have looked OK, but then when they get in and have a look, they, they find that the liver's really fatty or they find some, something else um, that, that makes it untransplantable. Um, in the DCD pathway, uh, that's where, so that's the patients who we withdraw treatment on. So we would have the team set up in theatre ready waiting um, and then we would withdraw treatment um, and wait for that person's heart to stop, stop beating until we transferred them into theatre. So they're the, they're the ones that are a bit more um, uncertain. Uh, there's actually there's time scales in terms of how long we would wait for that person to die. Um, and certainly for liver donation, it, it's usually only about half an hour. So it, it's it's very strict time scales. Um, so that that's kind of where a lot of the uncertainty comes from as to whether or not they're, they're gonna go ahead and be able to donate or not. Um, so hopefully we make it into theatre and uh, once the organs um, have been removed and um, inspected and the surgeons are happy with everything, they get packed up usually on ice um, and then they get transported to their new homes. So just wanted to kind of cover the law change because it is quite... Um, been in the, the press quite a lot. I'm sure most of you will have heard of it, but um, Kira was a nine-year-old girl who unfortunately died following a car crash in 2017. Um, and her dad very kindly gave permission for her organs to be donated, which saved the lives of four people. Um, and one of those people was nine-year-old Max, who received Kira's heart. He was actually transplanted up here in Newcastle. Um, and him and his family campaign, campaigned in favour of an opt-out system in England, um, which was given royal assent uh, back in March 2019. Um, and then it came into effect in, uh, in England in May uh, of last year. So we now operate an opt-out system. So um, if you don't fall into one of the excluded groups, then you are now uh, considered to have no objection to organ donation. Um, so and um, although this doesn't actually, um, so actually I'll cover the excluded groups. They are people um, who are not ordinarily resident in the UK or who are not here voluntarily or do not have the mental capacity um, to appreciate the law change um, and anyone under the age of 18. So um, you have to fall, not fall into one of those groups um, for, the, for the law to apply to you. And obviously if you've got a registered decision, then we, we know what your decision is. Um, so it wouldn't apply then either. So um, although this, won't actually change the amount of people that could potentially donate. Um, our donor pool is still the same size. It, it's the law change is not going to affect that. Um, it hopefully will encourage more people to have um, the conversations with their families and record their decision um, on the organ donor register, whether that be an opt-in or an opt-out. Um, just from my personal experience, um, families find it really hard when they don't know they've never had the conversation um, we have that conversation with them and ask them about what type of person their loved one was and what they think they would want but it's so much easier for families to make the decision when they know it's what their their loved one wanted um, so in terms of statistics, we haven't actually got any published statistics from this year yet, but 
um, from last year, um, there was approximately 2.3% of the population have opted out on the ODR, uh, and that's compared to 39% of the population who've opted in. So I think we're probably expecting those numbers to have gone up slightly, but hopefully the opt-ins have gone up more than the opt-outs. Um, so just wanted to cover this because obviously without our donors and without their, their families, we wouldn't have any transplants. So just wanted to tell you about um, what we do for them during the process and afterwards. So like I said before, we have very close communication with them. Um, we offer things like keepsakes, um, can organise chaplain appointments, any special wishes to have. Um, anything we can do to help them if they want music played, anything like that, um, we can do that for them. Um, and when we take the, the patient to theatre, we always observe a moment of honour just before the operation commences. Uh, this is where we ask everyone who's involved in the operation just to, to take a moment and have a think about the person and the, their, their family and their gift of donation. Um, We'll update the family usually immediately after the retrieval's finished and we give them an update of what organs have been managed to be retrieved. Um, and then as part of our organisation, we do have a donor family care service who are the first point of contact for our donor families um, in the weeks and years after donation has occurred. Um, and they send out a letter, which is usually about two weeks after after donation and that's the final outcome so although we've told them what's happened after the retrieval operation for many different reasons sometimes the organs um don't get aren't able to be transplanted when they get to their destination so um so they get that final outcome letter um they also get um, some gold pin badges, which is what's in, in the picture. Um, and they're just a, a little mark of recognition of, of what their loved one has done and something for them to wear. And um, we quite often find people say they're a bit of a talking point and it, it, it enables them to talk about their, their loved one and tell somebody why, why they've got the pin and what it was for. Um, and finally, we get um, all of our donors are awarded an Order of St. John UK Award. So this was launched in 2013 um, and it is um, awarded to the donors rather than the families. But obviously the donors aren't there to come and receive it. So the families are invited to a ceremony. Um, so we'll have them all over the UK and they're, they're really lovely ceremonies. We usually attend and sometimes some people from the hospital where the, their loved one died um, and we get to see our families who we might not have seen for six months and catch up with them and um, and it's just a way of recognising what they've done and um, and yeah I'm sure Sharon will second me on saying that they are really, really nice really lovely ceremonies definitely. And that is the end of my presentation. So I will try and figure out how to sh stop sharing my screen. My screen. Well, that's fantastic. There we go. Um, fantastic, Lizzie. Very well done. Um, I'm, I'm just going to repeat that you are, uh, this is for the people who didn't get the introduction, you are Lizzie Barnes. Um, who is um, a specialist nurse, organ donation at the Newcastle Hospitals. Uh, but you're based, you cover a lot, about 11 different hospitals. And you've been assisted in this presentation by uh, Sharon Richardson. Okay. Um, before we go on to questions, can I just say that we offer, if you like, uh, a book of remembrance at the Freeman. And anyone, and they don't have to be liver patients, anyone is welcome to have an entry now, Book of Remembrance, in a beautiful oak case. It's in the Freeman Chapel. So if you, if, if there are any organ donors, families who want to put something in about their family member, they're more than welcome. Uh, the chaplaincy have all the details. Yeah, I'm sure there would be families interested in that, actually. That's really lovely and really nice to know. 
Good. So now we are open to questions. If anyone's got any questions, <laughs> please put your hand up if you've got a question for Lizzie or Sharon. Debbie. Um, can transplantation consent donors? Get a bit nearer your microphone, Debbie. Can transplant patients themselves become donors? That's a good question. That is Do you want me to ask Lizzie and give you a break from a presentation? Go on then, Sharon. Um, so, yes, absolutely. It, it will depend on what organ they had transplanted initially, um, but um, they would be able to donate potentially other organs. So it is very much an individual assessment of the patient at the time of when they are, we have a discussion with the critical care team. But yes, absolutely. So for example, with yourselves, it would be unlikely that um, a liver would be transplanted onward, um, but it could be that somebody who's had a liver transplant would be able to donate kidneys, pancreas, heart and lungs, for example. So yeah, that's possible. Excellent. Any other questions? Any? Uh, yeah, Mel? Can't hear you. I'll Hello. Know. There you go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Just to think, just Chris and I were talking during the presentation there, and the heart, the little badge, what a lovely idea. Never heard of that before. And yeah. um, it seems a shame that it's not a bit more widely. Yeah, it's a great it's idea. We're, we're quite up on in the community, obviously. Um, yeah. on. And so Chris made, made the comment, it'd be nice if you know, people had gravestones or whatever that could be included in that if it was a recognised symbol. Yeah. It's, it's um, a lovely idea, yeah. I also, yeah, I also yeah, I could, I could promote that a little bit. I um I also didn't know about the St John ambulance uh, St John no. order St John, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. I was the assistant county commissioner for St John for County Durham, uh, and uh, you know left twenty years ago, but I didn't know anything about this. And that's a great idea to give you bestow the order of St John. Absolutely so, fantastic. So the, the, the two things you've mentioned there. So in terms of kind of recognition of of symbols, it's actually a forget me not is our is our yes. symbol, along with a lot of other charities of, of similar That's nature. Right. The Gold Heart was only introduced a, a, a few years ago as, a, as an individual recognition and thank you to the families. The Order of St John is an amazing thing because NHS Blood and Transplant as an organisation, that, that was the very first event that they, they um, instigated with the charity of, of Order of St John as a, as a national recognition. And I think um, probably what most people don't know is it's actually the Lord Lieutenant who actually presents these to the families um, yeah. as the Queen's representative. So not only is it the Order of St. John, it's the Lord Lieutenant who is heavily involved in this as well for the entire country. But obviously within our region, we have a number of Lord Lieutenants and an Order of St. John. And like Lizzie said, they are amazingly emotional um, but for us, as, as the nurses go into them, they're very humbling for us. And it, we like to go and meet our families again. Um, so they're normally families from about nine months to a year previous. I um, mean, it is, it is lovely for us to see our families again and spend that little bit of time with them. Um, so they are lovely, lovely ceremonies. Fabulous. Well, any more questions for our nurses? Oh, yes, Joan. I would just say that we could um, certainly put an article in the next newsletter about that uh, recognition mm -hmm. um, because I, I didn't know anything about it either. Um, and, you know, it, I, I think it's a, it's a lovely gesture and it must be very special to the people. Mm -hmm. We'll liaise cool. with you to get something in. We'll no do problem. that. We'll do that. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, Lizzie and, and Sharon, thank you so much. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if you like, because we've got two exceptionally good speakers now, Peter Robinson-Smith <laughs> and Siobhan Dawson. Um, so, Peter, you've got your presentation uh, ready, I believe. Um, if it is okay, I will leave, as if on cue, the phone is ringing. Um, cause absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. Fortunately. So thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for coming. Okay, take thank care. Thank you. Bye. Hopefully my screen should be shared now, John. Yeah, that's, yes, full screen, Peter, that's excellent. Okay, brilliant. So good evening and uh, 
following on from Lizzie's uh, presentation there about the donation pathway, um, Siobhan and I are going to do a little presentation around about the, the recipient journey. So obviously looking at some of the names that are on, on the side of my screen, there are some really, it's really lovely to see some uh, familiar faces, some local. Um, I think there are some who have come from quite a long way away to, to visit this tonight. Um, so it's really lovely to see some of those recipient faces and hopefully as we kind of talk through this, some of this you'll recognize and some of it will be a bit revision for you. And it's, it's just really nice to see so many friendly faces. Um, I'm gonna talk about who, who we are, um, a little bit about transplant assessment, some of the teams that are involved, what happens at the time of transplant, and then a little bit about post-transplant. And uh, some of the people on the call might recognize some photographs that I've used at the end of this. So uh, please don't be embarrassed or point at them on your screens. So that, that's who we are. We are, me and Siobhan are, are the liver transplant coordination team. Um, we're ably assisted. Some of you who've had transplants here in the past will have, have been seen by Sandra Latimer. Um, and obviously uh, elsewhere in our team, we've got Leanne, who's our social worker, and we're ably assisted by the, the hepatologists and the surgeons who we all form part of the liver transplant team at Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. Quick little bit about what the liver does. Obviously most people on this, on this meeting have had some element of knowledge about liver disease in the past or either personally or with a loved one. But it, the liver's got hundreds and hundreds of jobs that it does. The main ones are that it filters and cleans your blood. It makes proteins to, that you need for blood clotting and it helps fight infection. It makes bile, which then digests the food from your gut, stores vitamins and minerals. And like I say, it makes the bile. And then what people often ask is why, why do I need a transplant? Well, sometimes because you've got a long-term chronic disease and I've listed some there because obviously you know, there's large links through this organization to, to PBC and PSC, but all elements of liver disease. So we do a lot of transplant assessments for, for PSC, PBC, uh, alcoholic liver disease, hepatitis C, um, the growing epidemic of NAFLD and NASH, and also autoimmune hepatitis. Included in our assessments are liver, people who've got liver cancer, so hepatocellular carcinoma, to give it its full name, or we also assess and transplant people who've got acute liver failure. So you might recognize things like paracetamol poisoning or paracetamol overdoses, but also there's a, a disease called seronegative hepatitis where we don't know what's caused the hepatitis. So that will often be called non-A, non-B. Um, so we transplant for that as well. And the acute liver failure patients will go through the super urgent pathway as opposed to the chronic disease pathway, because they are more than likely to die within a very, very short time frame. When we talk about symptoms of liver disease, some people have many, some people have none, but generally there are no presenting symptoms, often in, in kind of quite a lot of cases. Some people will present because they're jaundiced or they're generally tired and the GP's done a very good set of bloods and it shows problems with the liver function or some people present because they're not digesting their food properly, or the liver disease is found as a byproduct of some other investigations. It's a common misconception from the public that liver disease is all about alcohol. And I'm sure those of you who've been through transplant assessment or at any point in your life have been um, jaundiced or told someone you've got liver disease. One of their first things they'll say is, yeah, I didn't know you were a drinker or I didn't know you drank or the question from the a doctor in an A&E department will be about what you drank. But in the Northeast, we do have a large alcohol population, um, but it's not all about alcohol. As you can see from the, the percentages there, in the last year, we, tra we transplant assessed about a quarter of our patients for alcoholic liver disease, but also 15% were because of NAFLD, around 10% was because of liver cancer, Around 8% were paracetamol overdoses and super urgent patients. And then others at the bottom, so autoimmune hepatitis, cryptogenic cirrhosis, hemochromatosis, around is, makes up about 25% of our assessment population as well. So it's not just alcohol, despite what the public might think. When you've seen your hepatologist and this, or your, your loved one seen a hepatologist and they start to talk about transplant assessment, for us, is, is me and Siobhan and, and Leanne and the rest of our team, 
this is the start of our journey. This is the start of where you become involved with us. Um, and the questions you're going to be asking is, am I sick enough to need a transplant? Do, do I need one? Am I, am I going to get through this? And they're, they're natural questions. Um, often people will ask if there's alternatives to transplant. And yes, there are. Of course there are. Hopefully they've been investigated as we kind of go through this journey by a hepatologist. They'll have looked for different things or tried other things before they referred you to Newcastle. But transplant is, is a destination and a treatment for liver disease. So it's a very good idea to explore it. We're going to go through a bit in a moment about what tests are involved in the assessment, but it's it's basically working out that we know that your liver do, doesn't do what it should do, but it's identifying whether there's anything else we need to do before we start in going through a 10 hour operation to, to transplant your liver and making sure that everything else is going to be fit and healthy enough to survive that. So, as I said earlier on, we're, we're a team. Um, we're quite a big team. You'll meet lots of us through the assessment, but we are a team. So as you can see, there's, there's me and Siobhan here. I think Leanne's on the call somewhere, who's our, our social worker, who's very important to us. And there's a team of hepatologists, surgeons, anaesthetists, dietitians, psychiatrists, lots of different people who are involved in ensuring that we get the right result and that we make you as well as we possibly can. As I've said, that looking at the tests that are involved, we do some very simple tests and we do some more complex ones as well. So there are lots and lots of bloods, as you can imagine. Every time you come to the hospital, you get more bloods done. We, we kind of just love doing them. And it, they, they kind of allow us to track your liver disease as we kind of assess you for the transplant. We do simple tests, ECGs, uh, chest x-rays, um, which allow us just to look at how your, your heart is kind of beating, whether there's any problems with your lungs, um, whether there's fluid around your lungs, whether the, your diaphragm has been pushed up. We do, in the assessment, we do things like echoes to look to make sure your heart works properly, that all the chambers beat at the same time. We do uh, what's called a CPEX test, where we put you onto an exercise bike and make you pedal because we want to watch what your heart and lungs do when we make them work harder. The translation into real life is that when we're operating on you and you encounter a problem because you bleed or you have some kind of element where there's a problem we want to make sure your heart and lungs are going to cope with that we'll also do imaging like a ct or an mri to look at the size and the shape of your liver we'll look at where the blood vessels come from and end up because everybody's in slightly different positions and then we'll do things like anthropometry because from our dietitian colleagues we know that when you have liver disease the, the chance that you're malnourished or that your, your nutrition is not as good as it could be is high so we make sure we do anthropometry so that we can track the changes as you get better or as, as some people decline. And then the, the transplant assessment is now just a one day um, visit to Newcastle. You come a week before and you meet me and more Siobhan and Leanne in the clinic and we go through some questions. We try and answer and allay some of your fears that you might have about assessment. And then we, we take all of our bloods, you get clerked by the junior doctors. And then you come a week later for a full day, so 8.30 till 5 p.m., where we do all of those tests that are there um, in just, just one day. So it's not as long as it used to be. Um, I can see some faces that are nodding and going, oh, that, when I went, it was a week, or when I went, it was three days. And it, that, that's what it used to be, but we've managed to get that down, and partly that's secondary to COVID, but also because it's, it just makes it easier for you. And what when we kind of set looked at how we did our assessments, we found that people just like to come in for one day. When we talk about transplantation, we do have to talk about the fact that this, in essence, is palliation. Transplant is a destination and it is the end of the road for some people because some people aren't well enough for this. So what if you don't get listed? Well, the answer is it's not the end of the world because there may, may be because you don't get listed because you're actually too well at this point in time. So that's one of the things. It may be that you've been referred too late, or it may be that you're sicker than you've, you, you think. And so sometimes transplantation and assessment is as far as we go. But obviously there are a lot of people who we, we do go on to transplantation. So once we've done the assessment and we've worked out as a team that transplantation is for you, then we would go ahead to put you onto the transplant list. And the question that once you go on the list, everybody wants to know is how long am I gonna wait? 
Well, the simple answer is, I, I don't know. Siobhan doesn't know, Leanne doesn't know, none of the doctors know. It all depends, as Lizzie's just explained, on what we get offered and, and making sure that the right liver comes up for you, that's the right size and the right blood group. Our list works with what's called a national livering, liver offering sequence. And that's where every liver that we get offered in the UK gets offered to everybody at the same point on the transplant waiting list through what's called a transplant benefit score. The transplant benefit score is your bloods in clinic that we measure and then that we feed them into a database to make sure that the person in the country who has the highest benefit from that donated liver will get offered that liver. And so whoever comes top of that sequence will be offered the liver, whether they're in Plymouth or whether they're in Newcastle or whether they're in Aberdeen, wherever they are, whichever centre they're registered with, will get offered that liver. And as Lizzie's explained, we get DBD and DCD livers. And we also now transplant split livers here in Newcastle. And then we do are now starting to transplant livers from donors who've previously been hepatitis C positive um, because we know that they're very good quality livers and the treatments for hepatitis C are very good and very uh, efficient. When a liver becomes available, we one of, one of us as transplant coordinators will call you and bring you into the hospital. Meanwhile, we're sending teams out to, to meet people like Lizzie to go and get the liver and bring that liver back to Newcastle. And then once the liver is accepted by the surgeons and it comes back to Newcastle, the operation to put it into you will take around about six to eight hours and then you'll go straight to intensive care after the operation. Talking about it is a lot easier than doing it for the surgeons, and there are risks involved in this. Obviously, there is risk that you die. We, we can't get away from that at the time of transplantation. It's a very real risk. There's a risk that the liver doesn't work. There's a risk that we put the liver in, and some of the joints in the liver will, will block, and that's called vascular thrombosis. With any operation, there's risks of bleeding and infection. With a transplant, there's risks of rejection. And then there's risks that your kidneys might not like this, especially the intensive care bit. So there's complications with that. And we're doing joins with your bile duct and your, your veins and your arteries. So there's risks of bile problems afterwards. This is what a nice transplanted liver should look like. It should be nice and smooth on the surface, as you can see. It should have nice sharp edges. So just above the, the surgeon's kind of index finger, You'll see as the liver comes down and into the into the, the cloth that it's nice and sharp and it should be very reflective as you can see the lights reflecting on the surface of the liver so that's a lovely healthy transplanted liver but as i say transplantation is the beginning of the journey and then you you start then to go and live your life you would only be in hospital nowadays for about two weeks assuming you have no major complications and within about six months, we would estimate that you could return to work. Some people have gone back at three months. Three months, we would suggest you could go back to driving and reliving a normal life. And then all the things that you can normally do, if you have not been transplanted for alcohol, you can have a glass of wine with your dinner. Um, younger people will go on a family plan and, and can live normal lives after transplantation. It's no big thing. And these are some of the people who we have transplanted. And hopefully, as you can see that, you know, there's people who've been then away to Africa. There's, there's very happy couples at the top. Um, there's, there's young Thayab at the bottom there. Uh, there's a very well-known Liver North family <laughs> who, who got to celebrate some, some really lovely, joyous events. I'm really sorry I haven't got the picture of the granddaughter, but joyous family events. The transplantation <laughs> allows you to, to see. Um, I've said too much there. Um, and just going on to live your life after transplantation is... Is, is such a lovely thing you, you're able to do. And so the journey that comes from Lizzie and her team and then through our team, through assessment, is just the beginning. And that's enough for me. So thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Peter. If you stop your screen, we'll get um, we'll be able to see everyone's face for um, uh, any questions. That's it. Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Peter. That was very poignant. Uh, and I could see that uh, Mel and Chris's faces light up. <laughs> well, that's lovely for them. Uh, right, any questions for Peter or for uh, Siobhan? I've got one. Okay, Who's, who is it? It's Debbie. Debbie. Oh, hi, Debbie, I couldn't see your face, right. Um, Peter, when you talk about um, 
did I need a transplant um, and liver failure in particular? I know in my circumstance, um, I can't hear you, Debbie. No, Debbie, you, you I can't hear you. Well, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, I, I can hear you say, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you talk about, did I need a transplant um, and liver failure, um, I know in my situation or my circumstances, I was actually only ever in the very first stages of liver failure. Um, the reason why I got transplanted was because my liver was extremely large and it was estimated at about 28 pounds. So that was the reason I had my transplant. Um, and they knew that it was the size that was actually going to cause these problems and not actually the fact that I was in liver failure itself. Yeah. Um, and also, the, I don't know if you know why, but the, I, I've never known the answer to this. They actually removed my gallbladder during the operation itself, so I've never had one well, since yeah. then. So obviously, things can still function correctly. Is the gallbladder necessary? Is, is it necessary? No, you, you, your gallbladder is just a, a little sac that sits underneath your liver um, where the bile duct comes out of, and it just collects bile and feeds it through the bile duct away into your bowel. So every transplanted liver comes without a bile duct attached, but with the bile duct. So the gallbladder is taken off, and then we sew the new liver directly onto your bile duct. Right. So if you've got a disease called a PVC or PSD, then that, that bile duct gets joined directly onto your bowel. Um, but no, every liver that comes and transpl is transplanted, we, we take the gallbladder off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting as well, you're mentoring the, the bile duct itself, because again, with me, it was, oh, I don't know, 17 years later, 15, 17 years later. Um, I actually had to have a, another major operation where my transplant cell was opened up again, or two thirds of it was opened up again. And they had to, and the problem was with the bile duct itself. So they had to construct me a new one from the duodenum and um, then sort of replumbed me in a different way, should I say. I don't know the, yep. the, the technical terms for it. So it did, I did have problems myself, but only a long time later, you know. Yeah. In yeah, that, 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 that quite often happens. Yeah. All right, then. I think Sean's got a hand up, John. Yeah, Sean, wherever you are. Oh, there you go, Sean. Thank you. That was really very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, in the time when people are waiting for transplant, what sort of things that they can do psychologically or physically if they're well enough that might help prepare them for okay. the surgery and the time afterwards? So it, physically, the best thing you can do is remain as active as you can. Um, we, we now have, have started a prehabilitation program here at the Freeman in Newcastle where we're actively encouraging you to, to be as active as we can. So we're trying to get people to do around about seven or 8,000 steps a day. Um, so so it's, it's about getting out and walking, simple exercises. We don't want you training for the Great North Run, but making sure that you, you are as active as you can. Um, and, and physically, that will the fitter you are pre-transplant, the fitter you will be post-transplant is, is generally the way it works. Um, in terms of preparing you psychologically, then we, we have a regular uh, waiting list clinic, which we, we hold on a Friday afternoon, um, where you will have uh, me, Siobhan, um, Leanne, we will, we will sit down and see you. Um, it's longer than a normal clinic appointment, so we, we sit for a half an hour sometimes, sometimes longer, to allow you the full opportunity to go through what you have worries and, and difficulties with. Because um, often that you know you or your loved ones will have problems that you you want answered that can't don't get answered by five minutes with a consultant. Uh -huh. So it's 
those kind of things that we, we do to help you as much as we can. Thank you very much. That's Excellent. Okay. Um, John was next, then Mel. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for highlighting the issue around alcohol. Um, and I think it's a difficult one because, it, you know, do, do, do you go to one way and you actually make the stigma worse for the people who were suffering from alcoholic liver disease? Um, and it's a, I think it's very complicated and very important and very important that as a group, we are not judgmental. Um, because in my mind, no one sets out to become an alcoholic. It's something that happens. So I'm really pleased that you brought it into the equation to highlight it. And, and I think it's it's worthwhile pointing out that, you know, in order to be assessed for transplantation, if you have alcohol related liver disease, you will have stopped drinking for at least six months. So people, you know, there, there's obviously the very famous story of George Best or Larry Hagman. You know, people like that who've had liver transplants because of alcohol, but at the point in the UK where you can be assessed for transplant, you must be abstinent for six months. It's not that, you know, we're, we're allowing people to drink a bottle of whiskey and then come in for transplant assessment. That That's not allowed. So there is a commitment to lifestyle change prior to, to assessing for transplantation. But no worries. Thank you. That's right. Um, right. Mel? Yeah, hiya. Yeah, just two things, really, um, about both points. Um, if I can say to anyone prior to transplant, just be fit. It is horrendous. The other end when you're not fit. Uh, don't smile. It's not funny. Um, <laughs> but I struggle to get to the end of the corridor and back most days. And the recovery, the other end of it was just horrendous because of it. So stay as fit and active. Definitely a lesson learned this time around. Um, but yeah, and the other thing is Peter Barlow has done no one any favours. Talking about the alcohol issue, you could just throttle them. And I've tuned in literally just for that storyline because I knew it was coming, and it's just ridiculous. And sort of does no one any favours at all. Yeah. <laughs> that must be something to do with Coronation Street or something. It is. It? I wasn't going to yeah. mention it, but things are going to be the alcohol issues have brought up. Yeah, all right. Certainly, I know from my perspective, so I'm just moving on, I will shut up in a sec. Just with the alcohol, when I was first diagnosed with, with liver disease, and they told me I'd have about four or five, well, how long was it? A number of years anyway, yeah. before I was looking at transplant. I remember for many, for a long time, not telling anyone what was wrong with me. People clearly knew I was unwell because I was hugely unwell. But I would never tell anyone because I was so ashamed because of the stigma that, that's attached to the alcohol issue, which I think it, it's out, sort of my side of the coin when it is a different issue that causes it. That isn't ever highlighted, and that's a real shame, I think, because it would certainly have helped me in the past. Yeah. Just an observation, really. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, any more questions for Peter? Catherine? Yeah, Catherine. I, uh, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to, to Peter and to everyone else who's done the um, done talks this evening. They're hugely, hugely helpful. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate, well, I don't know if it was actually specifically said, but to, to say that um, the Freeman do offer the best um, liver transplant assessments. In, yeah. <laughs> well, you're, looking pretty good at this. you're looking pretty good on it. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking pretty good on it. I was very sad not to go through the actual transplant at the Freeman, but I have survived down um, yeah, from London and instead. Um, but yeah, the, my, my, uh, I was set up well, like um, the transplant assessment at the Freeman, um, yeah, Peter looking after me and others, all the stuff there. Um, I knew what was coming and I was ready for it, even when I had to move then to two different hospitals. Um, it mm -hmm. set me up properly and I, I felt fine. So thank yeah. you. That's great. Catherine, can I ask you, did you know about the little golden heart and the Order of St. John for the... I didn't know. That was hugely, um, hugely wonderful to know. Yeah. Really, yeah, really lovely. Good. Um, and yeah. I found that as someone who has recently received a donated liver, I just found that really, really special to hear as well. So um, it is. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think both uh, both those nurses, bless them, have, have gone back to work. But um, huge thanks to them as well. I talk was fab. So. Brilliant. Uh, Joan, question, or was it Liz? Did you have a question, Liz? Or were you just wafting your head? No? Okay. Joan? I was just going to say, I don't know whether Pamela heard about the heart and the um, the order 
of St. John, um, which was uh, probably before you joined the meeting. I'll let John tell the story. Oh, thank you so much. I, um, You're what it is, Pamela, is that um, the, um, the uh, Specialist Nurses Organ Donation arranged for the donor family to be awarded um, the Order of St. John and be given a little gold uh, heart as a memento, uh, which is a nice touch, I think. And um, it's something we knew nothing about. So I think that's great. And uh, we will be putting it in the newsletter and, and, and getting the full story. But I think it's a, it's a heartening thing for people who've had an organ, um, re organ recipients to know that. Um, what I... Um, uh, what did I want to say now? Oh, yes, Peter, thank you very much for that. But what I did want to say is that um, we have a helpline, as you probably know, and they are trained uh, in basic counselling skills. And some of them have had our transplant recipients. So the, there is, I know we are not part of the team, but we are helpful as aftercare. And it's, you know, it's worth knowing that we're here with uh, with trained people, if they want to talk to someone who's been down the journey. So, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, excellent talk, and um, we'll we'll uh, be putting that in the newsletter. Now, I want to introduce it to someone new, to uh, many of you, uh, Pamela Pamela Denham, who has um, a story to tell. She's given permission uh, for us to record it. Uh, it's about a heart transplant. Are you okay to talk, Pamela? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that I wasn't here to hear the first talk. Um, and it is nice to know about the award. Um, the, what we have just heard is familiar to me for reasons which will become apparent, I think. Um, I certainly recognise an assessment process. Um, you know, I know everybody likes a story with a happy ending, and you may feel that mine doesn't, but actually there is a silver lining, and I think it also helps to get an important message across. Um, and this is something I had written but elsewhere, um, and it was called, It Could Happen to You. So I, I will just give it as I wrote it. Um, at that time um, and it, it's about hearts not livers but you know <laughs> similar things apply and I started off by saying that I saw that wonderful film on TV about the heart transplant team at the Freeman and and I was just absolutely full of admiration for that transplant team and everybody dedicated to helping and supporting the patients in need of hearts. And I learned about the advances that had been made um, in recent years. And that was all great, but it was just so awful to see so many people very ill, waiting for a new heart, sometimes for years, and some dying while they were on the list. And really, I mean, it took me back to, to December 1992. And that was when my, my very fit partner, um, he was only 59, very fit. And we were very excited about going on a trip to Egypt over New Year. So we got there after a very early flight. We settled into our hotel by the Nile and two wonderful days of sightseeing. But on the third day, my partner felt very tired. And over the next few days, he got weaker and weaker and was treated for chest infection. Back home, he was diagnosed with an atypical pneumonia, which left him with a very weak heart. From being someone who could run half marathons and go for long walks in the hills, he became decades older. He couldn't walk to the end of our very short road and had to think about how many times he could go upstairs during the day 
He used to pile things up on the third step so that he could easily reach them and then take everything up in one go. Things did improve a bit with training, but he was still very weak. And I just happened to be in the doctor's surgery one day and his GP asked me how he was. And, and I said, well, you know, if the only thing that's wrong with him is a weak heart, can he have another one? So, yes, um, yes, this is possible. Um, or, although my partner was somewhat apprehensive of this thought. We talked to the transplant team at the Freeman um, and we met lots of people who'd had a transplant and that convinced them that this was worth investigating. So um, we went through the, an assessment, which was rather longer than the one you've just heard about. And it, it was very comprehensive. After all, this was 1993. And they wanted to be make, make absolutely sure that he, he would take the drugs and would follow the procedures. But um, yes, um, we accepted that um, and, and went through the assessment process. Afterwards, realizing this, realizing this could be very serious, he wanted to go on um, a tour to see his relatives, which we did, but we took it very easily. Um, and to be honest, it was a break for me as well. Back home again, at the consultation to get the results of the assessment, we were told there was an 85% chance that the new heart would function when transplanted. And if success, successful, his chances of survival and quality of life would improve. Rather hesitantly, I asked what his chances would be without the transplant. And you know, to this day, I can still feel his hand gripping my arm as he waited for the answer, which was in the first year about the same, but thereafter much better with the transplant. So he agreed. Before going on the waiting list, he had to have his teeth out because they, they're a potential source of infection. And this happened on Friday, the 23rd of October, 1993. You probably don't notice, but every time we have a cold October, they refer back to October, 1993, as being one of the coldest in, in recent years. Um, and so that's not good for somebody with a weak heart. And actually, my partner died in his sleep on the Saturday night. <laughs> I dialed 999. I just, frankly, I, I, I didn't know what to do. And the resuscitation team came, but, but he couldn't be resuscitated. Now, you know, you may feel that we were unlucky, um, but you know, the way it seems to me now is that he died with hope and with hindsight, without the anxiety of being on the waiting list um, for years. You won't be surprised that after this, I registered as an organ donor. And that is why I have met Joan and Sean on the blood and transplant uh, research project that on the public and patient um, involvement panel, because I wanted to say thank you to that team who gave him hope. And we just, we just don't know what lies around the corner. You perhaps you are probably a more knowledgeable audience than, than a, a general, but we are someone we care about, may need a new organ or be in a position to give the gift of life to, to somebody else. And um, just a few years ago, when a friend was killed in a car accident, it did help at the funeral to hear that she had given the 
gift of life to four other people through organ donation. I think so what comes home to me is that everybody just seems to think that because the law has changed and consent is presumed, that you don't actually need to take any action unless you want to opt out of donating organs. But when I was dressed up at an event with an apron with the five organs that are transplanted, um, I find it gave me license to go and talk to people and to ask them. And I was surprised at how many assumed that because they just ticked the box on their driving license, that this would happen. They didn't realize that a family member would actually be asked for their consent and at a very distressing time for them. And if they didn't know uh, the person's wishes, I think they find could find it very difficult to decide. You, you, we, we all have a tendency to put off things, something just like making a will, but not to do so does create problems for the relatives left behind. So my message to everyone, um, which I expect many of you will actually agree with, is that it's important that people make sure that they talk to their family about the possibility of a transplant. Perhaps when they're making a will and, and that's a, a topic on their mind, because it's important. It could make a huge difference to somebody's life. And I would just want to encourage everybody to have had that conversation and to encourage others to do it. Thank you for listening. Excellent, Pamela. What a lot of courage it took to tell that story. Thank you so much. That's a really poignant story and, uh, and helpful, I think, for people that you've seen some goodness in it. Mm. You know, that's really good. Um, on, on the subject of, um, of telling people, we've, uh, we're in the busy, which we've changed all of our leaflets now to include this bit on, yes, I donate. Uh, all of our leaflets now carry that message and that it's important to tell your family yeah. uh, that, you, you know, so we, do, we push that as much as we can. But of course, people don't read everything, but nevertheless, if they do read it, they'll understand they've got to tell their family what their wishes are. Yeah, because anyone... I, I had not realised um, um, until you know, recently we, we now may get organs from um, people who, who have just who have died in hospital. Um, and it is possible that my partner's liver and kidneys would have been fine and could have been donated. And you yeah. know, so, so yeah. I realized, you know, I think I would probably have just said yes because of the situation we were in, but it's not exactly um, the time that, that you want to have to think about it. So uh, that, that reinforces the, the, the point for me. And I'm so glad that you've amended your leaflet. Yeah, it's really difficult conversation time, isn't it? Yeah. So difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Has anyone got any questions for Pamela? Well, that's good, Pamela. You're off the hoop, but that was excellent talk. Thank you so much. For, oh, Joan's got a question. I haven't got a question. I just want to say a huge thank you, Pamela. It, you know, it, it, I, well, you know that I find your story incredible. And the fact that you can talk about it is even more so. So thank you. Uh, it's very important. And, and we will we'll be able to share the message that you've got uh, with lots of people. So yeah. thank you again. That's right. Chris, Mel, sorry. Hiya. Yeah, just, just uh, thanks to Pamela. It was, it was lovely. To, yeah, very difficult to hear a story sort of having been being so close to, to to that scenario ourselves. It, it really yeah. brought it home to, to people like myself, I'm sure, and, and others here. Um, but just just to, to 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 support the wider thing is, I bore everyone to death about organ donation, and I just think. As recipients, it's our responsibility to do so. Um, I'll yeah. talk to anyone, any scenario, 
any group, any meeting, anyone who be like who will listen to me really. Um Facebook just all the time just send them through and I and I make right. them more. No apology for it. And I just think as recipients, it's kind of the least that we can do, really. Just not sure where everyone else does as well, but just for people if you need to. Excellent, Mel. Well, we've got you signed up now for giving talks on behalf of the well, team. <laughs> well, you know, you know I'm all right for that, John, anyway. But yeah. I didn't know that I would be able to donate. The oh, that's good, that. yeah. So that's, that's actually really good, good to know. Um, yeah. Well, just to before. Uh, Debbie's uh, just uh, excellent that thanks thanks um, uh, Mel just before I bring Debbie in I'll just tell Pamela that this to whole talk including the bit about the um, Order of St John and the Gold Heart uh, will be on YouTube so yeah. you'll be able to watch it I'll send you the link uh, it'll probably be on by tomorrow yeah, uh, so you. you will be able to see the first part of the talk that, that was given by um, uh, Lizzie Barnes Okay, who's yeah. who was a specialist nurse organ donation? Um, so Debbie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, with regards to you, Pam, a very, very brave woman. Um, and in regards to that, I've this sort of similar situation. Um, my mum herself, she died oh, 27 years ago now. She herself was a transplant patient, she wasn't liver, she was a uh, kidney but it is a hereditary condition, and that's where I got my condition from. Now, my my mum, she she died not after the transplant. It was a long time after because she had a number of other medical issues to deal with as well. And she ended up on the neurological ward, and I can remember, you know, they'd sent her onto the ward from ITU, she knew in the heart of heart she was going to die and she wasn't going to survive. And I looked at my dad, knowing the situation, and by then I'd had my transplant as well. And um, I looked at my dad, I said, shall we go and talk to the doctors? And then um, we did. Uh, we sat in an office, we had a chat, and it was real, more like a, a, a double-sided coin, really, because we offered... Knowing that we'd had transplants, we offered my mum's organs for transplantation. Um, and unfortunately, they couldn't, she couldn't donate any because of the illnesses she had and the type of medication that she was on. She was unable to do so. But I felt quite honoured in a way that we were in the position where we could, and you know, at least we tried ourselves to give somebody life. You know, and it's 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 a regret, but it was not of our making. You know, we did, we tried, and we're forever grateful and forever will be. So thank you. Excellent. And Sean, you had a question now. Sean, just to say, Pamela, to say thank you and how powerful that was to hear the fuller part of the story. And definitely an inspiration to try and, you know, get the message out more. So thank you very much for that. It would be good to talk about it, you know, more when we meet again. Yeah. Excellent, Sean. Thanks for that. Thank you. So that concludes the talk part of our meeting. We've now got Joan Hall.